Uh, okay, so thank you everyone for, for joining. Uh, thank you for uh, being here and you know attending my talk. Um, today I'll be talking about uh, a really nice story, or at least to me it's very uh, close to heart, which is how I developed an open source library for accessibility um, on Android, uh, also called Ally. Uh, so this is a part of, or th this whole project and this whole idea came um, to me through my thesis project where I just had to build something for my thesis. And I always wanted to uh, go back and give something back to the community, uh, which is why I chose accessibility as a topic that's not that, uh, I, I wouldn't say uh, it's that, um, well used or that, that common in uh, most of applications. Uh, developers ge generally just kind of shy, shy away from accessibility or they don't know uh, enough about accessibility to you know start using it uh, and all these features in a good way. So this is why I wanted to build a library for accessibility. And, oh, sorry. Um, and if you want to know a bit about me, uh, if you haven't met me before at a conference or through some articles, books, stuff like that, um, I'm currently working as a video instructor at Razor, uh, which is the company behind the RayWendler.com team and website. Uh, I've been developing Android apps and, uh, you know, just generally programming since 2015. Um, and I generally do a lot of content creation. So recently I started a podcast here in Croatia, which is uh, just in Croatia uh, uh, and uh, in Croatian. Um, and it's about general IT stuff. Uh, I write some books and edit some books as well for the Raven Lake team. I do tutorials, um, articles, personal blog articles, and of course, for my job, video courses. And uh, recently, or last year, I became a Google developer expert for Android. And this year, I added the Kotlin category to my uh, area of areas of expertise, I guess. Uh, so if you want to know a bit more about me, I'll sh uh, show some links. But this talk is not really about me. Uh, this is about all of us developers, Android developers, and quite, quite frankly, the rest of the world, uh, our users. And uh, the, the reason why I chose accessibility is kind of just from sheer observation of numbers in the world. So if you um, haven't been uh, you know, familiar with this, there's more than, or more than 15% of the world suffers from at least one form of disability. Uh, and that can be uh, a mental disability, a physical disability, uh, some kind of a genetic thing, uh, a neurological disability as well. So just in general, any kinds of um, medical conditions that uh, those people have, which kind of, you know, makes their life a bit uh, harder, so to say, uh, or uh, some of the things that we don't, you know, uh, people who don't have these disabilities don't have and don't suffer from. So. Uh, more than 15% of the world, and uh, two to four percent of the world, uh, or of that uh, of that population, is actually suffering from, suffering from severe disability, meaning that they can't really function on their own. They require um, intense care, 24/7, uh, uh, you know, uh, help and stuff like that, which kind of makes their life a lot, lot uh, harder than you know what most of us can say. And if you take into account that more than two and a half billion people all over the world uh, use Android, um, that's, which is about 75% of the market, and that's according to last year's stats, uh, this means there's hundreds and hundreds of millions of users who suffer from at least one type of disability. Um, and this can be like a, I wouldn't say a small thing, but something that doesn't impact their lives as uh, as much. Let's say, you know, just like I have glasses for, uh, you know, short-sightedness, uh, some people might have the same form of disability, which doesn't really impair me from using applications, but a good amount of those people, you know, hundreds of millions of people suffer from something more severe, which uh, hinders them from using applications in a regular manner. So if you think about it, a lot of us, our users have some form of disabilities and they can truly use the apps to, uh, to their full extent. So if you think about it, you know, if your application is showing a bunch of videos or um, your application is showing an image, uh, a bunch of images, so let's say it's like a wallpaper app or something similar, then people who have full uh, vision impairment, which is uh, generally either uh, full blindness or color blindness, they might not be able to, or most, most probably won't be able to um, experience your applications to their full extent. They won't be able to use them uh, correctly. And there's a way to kind of defeat those numbers. Uh, even those people have ways to use, use our applications uh, 
to their abilities. And some of the things that we have in software can actually help them a lot. Uh, but those numbers are generally not as easily defeated or those numbers are uh, generally uh, just kind of neglected, which is what I wanted uh, to kind of change and promote through the usage of my library, uh, which is software accessibility. So if you don't know what software accessibility is or in general what accessibility is, it's just a way to define uh, common things in the world. Um, and in case of software, this is applications, which are more inclusive and more accessible to people with disabilities. Um, so for example, you know, if you have an app which uh, a blind person might be using, uh, you can use things like screen readers to um, bring the images or the videos closer to them. So they might not be able to see those videos or images, but they can still experience it through uh, detailed descriptions uh, and kind of, uh, and you know, uh, audio feedback instead of visual feedback. So software accessibility is just like, a lot of different things and rules that you can use to make apps more accessible and more inclusive. And the way I think about it is, you know, developers and designers usually look for all these ways we can make applications foolproof, which means that if there's a person who is not that tech savvy and they install your app, they should be able to use it, right? So they might know not know how to navigate through apps. They are not that tech savvy. They can truly understand things intuitively but you can still do some UX tricks and uh, user interface tricks to just help them use the app. And we think about foolproofing apps, but we don't really think about you know, disability proofing, which is not really a word, I just kind of make, made it up. Um, and accessibility is actually those set of rules that help support everyone when it comes to using applications and not just like a, an average user who is um, healthy or doesn't have any kinds of disabilities. And accessibility, or also known as ally, uh, which is like an abbreviation for the number, number of letters that is in the word, is just a set of rules, guidelines, and you know, even tools we have in our uh, software or modern software that help us regulate these applications and support different modes of um, applications. So, you know, uh, you probably see, uh, saw this in video games or different applications where you can turn on the colorblind mode. Um, this is a special mode that helps users with, uh, you know, color blindness, uh, different kinds of color blindness to experience your application. So they might not see all the um, things in images or all the contrast parts, uh, parts or like the textures in images without color blind mode. And this is a special mode just made for them. And there's a bunch of different modes we'll, we'll kind of go through uh, in this talk. Um, and, you know, similar to how UX guidelines help average people um, and I don't mean this in a bad way, but you know, the average person who might be using your app in the demographic, um, they help them uh, navigate the application and use the application. Accessibility is just like UX for you know, any kind of person with disabilities and any kind of disability. And some of the modes and tools you might be familiar with or some of the modes and tools uh, common software supports these days is uh, screen readers, text-to-speech, uh, speech-to-text or colorblind modes. These are all things you can turn on in the system to help you use applications in a different way. So screen readers uh, help you read the screen, obviously. So they go through different elements in the uh, hierarchy and then read those elements uh, or their description. So the user who might be um, suffering for full, from full uh, visual impairment, uh, they can still experience your app by being able to read the text and read the images even through software, so through the use of voice or uh, even some kind of gestural navigation um, or some kind of external hardware tools. Uh, Text-to-speech is uh, the same thing. It's kind of, it's a bit different where you don't really read the UI elements, but it, you rather read specific elements and their contents such as, you know, texts, um, or if you have uh, videos, you can turn on uh, different kinds of modes that help you translate those videos into subtitles and then read those subtitles. Uh, speech to text is a different thing, uh, which is kind of completely opposite, where you want to talk to the phone and then translate that into text. So this is useful for messages again, when you want to compose emails or send messages to your friends, uh, but you don't really see the, uh, the software keyboard or the, you can't really feel the f uh, physical keyboard because of your uh, you know, um, physical impairment or like visual impairment. Uh, then you can use your uh, voice to actually communicate to the software and through that, you know, translate in 
the uh, the, the voice you or the things you're saying into text. Um, colorblind mode is uh, what I kind of mentioned. Basically, you try to change up the spectrums uh, of e every co color or every um, you know image or component in your app to tweak it so that people who suffer from uh, the Deuteranopia or Tritanopia can actually see those or two and three color uh, blindness um, can actually see those spectrums. So if you're not sure how, how these things work, basically people who suffer from color blindness, not full monochromia color blindness, um, don't see certain specters or spectrums within, um, uh, within color. So you just shift those spectrums to like left or right, and this helps them uh, see those colors. Uh, there's a lot of different things here listed, which I'm not really going to go through all of them in detail. But the softer parts, the, the things that we can actually impact through our code uh, directly is uh, general UI scaling, voice assistance, and gesture or focus navigation. So all of these things um, can be influenced through our uh, content. So if you have text and elements which don't really scale well with UI, then you can fix those things to uh, to support, you know, scaling by 2x or 3x or, you know, whatever kind of scaling your uh, your users might use. Uh, voice assistance, obviously, you can develop different actions for uh, for your applications, which will let users use the, the app through their voice instead of, you know, having to manually go through things. Um, and, of course, gesture or focus navigation is really useful for people who suffer from uh, some motoric or, like, muscular um, uh, impairments or different kinds of disabilities that just prevent them from uh, moving or using their limbs to their full extent. So, you know, things like um, par uh, paralysis uh, of different limbs or different parts of the body or uh, ALS and different types of uh, muscle degradation or neurological diseases. So all of these things uh, affect your ability to move your limbs and use your fingers and different, you know, basically different parts of your body, which means that through gestures, you can move around the application and focus different things and use those things. So all of these features, as I mentioned, exist, exist in almost every operating system. But the problem comes when those features are not being used. So not every application supports these features out of the box. Not everyone thinks about these features or accessibility when they develop their apps. So it's important to kind of reflect back and see why we should do these things. Um, or how we can analyze our apps for um, for any kinds of issues we might have in terms of accessibility. And I'm talking about Android here. So uh, Android has two tools that, that actually help you with accessibility. Uh, one is called Accessibility Scanner, and the other, <clears throat> the other is called uh, Accessibility Test Framework, which I'll talk about a bit in a bit. Um, the Accessibility Scanner basically is an external application that you install. Uh, you'll allow it to draw over other applications, and then after it draws, uh, you can take screenshots, and those screenshots point out the issues you have in your code. So this kind of sounds a bit complicated, but <clears throat> this is bas basically what it does. So here is an image w uh, which I took of the Emitron app from our um, from our team, from the Razor team, and you can see this text uh, here, which is uh, called, or the ID is text duration. Um, and basically, this text duration uh, element has a problem with the text textual contrast. So the contrast between the background and the actual text, text color, which means that if a person is suffering from any kinds of color blindness or even full color blindness, they might not be able to see this text correctly. So what Accessibility Scanner does here is you take a screenshot, you can list through your screenshots, um, and you can click on every single element or every single issue that it detects. And then it gives you a detailed description on what the issue is, why it's there, or what the guideline is, and how to fix it. This is really cool, but it takes a lot of work to go through every single screen of your app, take a screenshot, you know, write down those issues in like a report. So you can, you can uh, if you're a QA person, <clears throat> or even if you're a developer, so you can create issues uh, or tickets for those issues. Um, so there's something else that you can use, which is the accessibility test framework. And it's a suite of testing tools or suite. Uh, and it lets you run accessibility tests in, uh, and checks in each of your tests. So the unit test you write or UI test you write. Um, the principle is that you run the special accessibility tests. And if there's an issue, your test fails. 
But it also lets you ignore some specific issues if you want your test just to pass for in terms of, you know, building the application and shipping uh, an actual APK. And it also, uh, you know, allows you to ignore these things if you don't really feel like, you know, your application su should support some of the issues you might have. Um, and the operating system also does some other things, so which I'll talk about later. But here is what the accessibility test framework looks like. And you can see kind of the background and, and the colors are not, not really aligning up, so sorry about that. But basically, you uh, create a class um, where you want, or like a test class where you want to run the UI test. You also enable accessibility checks through a simple function. And once you do that, uh, you can, uh, basically the, the framework runs all the general tests, all, all the basic tests, such as the contrast, the image view content description, and a lot of different things. And if any of those are not met, any of those requirements, then it fails the test, which is a really good thing. But then again, you might want to suppress some of the things because they are kind of annoying or you want to push out a build, which you can do by just, you know, setting a suppressing result matcher um, for, for a specific uh, text view or a specific type of text. And all of this is good, but it takes a lot of work to write all these tests, then fix them, then clean them up and ship your builds. And this is where Ally, which is the name of my um, library and not the actual accessibility abbreviation, although it kind of is, comes in. Um, so it's supposed to be an open source Android and Kotlin based library, which you plug into your app and then it gives you a report of the issues you have in terms of accessibility. So I think of it as leak canary for accessibility. You just plug it in, you got a report every time something happens or you move through your hierarchy. So um, it scans all the views in your hierarchy. So the entire tree does so rec recursively and it gives you or generates your report, a textual report uh, that you can you know, go through and see which issues or uh, which issues it found or which places, which views you didn't support uh, in terms of accessibility. Uh, and it's not just about, you know, scanning for issues. Uh, as I mentioned, it's about reporting it. So uh, what it does is it plugs into your lifecycle callbacks uh, through uh, just a simple function call. Um, in every on destroy callback of the fragment or the general activity, I take the view from root view from the hierarchy, I scan the entire tree, and then uh, I generate the, the complex report. I print it out in a file so that you can just open it and know about all of the issues that uh, you might have in your applications uh, or all the things that you might have to fix. So the issues, what it, uh, the issues it detects or like what can it do actually? So uh, the, this is a small disclaimer. The, access, uh, the library is not in like 1.0. I'm not fully happy with uh, all the things that I support. So it supports things like uh, text to background con contrast, but there's a lot of different things in the Android uh, UI toolkit that just don't make sense. So it's really hard to like fetch the, the background color of a button of like a regular button, which doesn't have any other thing because it's, uh, it's doing so through like uh, drawing things and there's no actual background, right? So you can't really detect it that easily or you have to support different kinds of buttons. So if you have a textual button or like a, just a text, which is, which has a background, then you can do it easily. But what if you have like a special custom button, which is, not actually a button, but like a, a view group and with some on-click listeners. So you have to de detect these things and it's really hard to do it sometimes. So I'm trying to improve the library as much as I can. Uh, it's currently in 8.6 version, something like that. So it's nearing its completion or like the 1.0 version that I would like to see, but it still has lots of things that I want to expand upon and just, um, you know, improve the quality of life and the, you know, the sheer amount of issues that I can detect. So it also detects stuff like text size. So if the text is too small, um, if you have a, a click listener on a view and it doesn't have a big enough touch area, so it detects those things. Uh, autofill and general hints for edit text objects. So these, these are really important for users in general, but especially for users with visual impairments. And finally, uh, image view content descriptions, which are again, really, really hard to um, build correctly in the library, which I'll kind of talk about uh, a bit later. So let's see how it works. Uh, I'm not actually going to show uh, or have a live demo because I don't believe in them as much <laughs> or I have issues generally. Uh, but basically the code is, there's a lot of code. So I didn't 
managed to put everything in the slides. So I'll, sh I'll share with you a link with, of the library at the end of the um, presentation, uh, but I'll just focus on some of the more important bits, so to say. So of course, if you want to generate a report, you have to start with a data type. And here is where the report class for me comes in. So it's like a general report where you see the parent ID of the parent, and you also see all the view reports within that uh, within that view or view group. So uh, this means that if you know if you have a single uh, constraint layout and three different images with issues, you will have a parent ID which is like the base ID, and you will have three reports, um, each report uh, showing you one of the image views. Uh, and it can of course be nested, and it's recursive because um, the entire view is a tree, not a linked list or anything like that which is why it has also these two properties. So the child layer reports and next level reports. Um, the child layer reports are real, really important because they basically take up nested reports for every single child view group. So in that previous example, if you have a constraint layout and you have another constraint layout within it, you will have a list of at least one report from the child constraint layout because it can also have multiple this is kind of when it, uh, where it gets tricky because you have to have a tree of reports, which I didn't really put in the in the slides because I think they would be a bit boring. Um, but you can check them out yourself uh, in the library a bit later. The next level of report is kind of what's important here is um, because when you're trying to print out a report, right? When you're trying to print out all the issues you have it's really hard to print them out in a recursive way, in a tree way, right? So what I did through the library is I have two algorithms. I have the first one which generates me a tree of reports or like a tree report. And the second algorithm just takes that tree and flattens it down to a linked list or like a general yeah, linked list, something like that, vector. Um, the idea here is that you don't really want a, to print out a tree, but it's really easy to print out a linked list, right? because it's just a for loop or a while loop. So this is what the next level report does. So once I have those child lay layer reports, I just flatten them out into one report, and then I have a linked list of reports, which is much easier to, to represent, uh, which I'll show in how it works in an actual image. Uh, the view reports actually have their parent ID, so you know uh, the parent ID and the type, so you know from which parent the, the view came. And you also have the uh, view ID of that um, of that and view type of that actual view, so you know which view or the which you know piece of the UI is um, oh, sorry uh, which piece of the UI is actually uh, an issue here. So which uh, which piece of UI you have to fix? So let's say th that image view in my example. And each view report item has uh, the issue type. So if it's like an image view content description issue or view touch area description, sorry, view touch area issue, uh, those will be the descriptions of the issue type. The issue itself might be, you know, um, your view touch area is not big enough, even though it has a click listener or a touch listener. Uh, and the fixed suggestion might be, hey, you know, you can increase your view size or you should increase your view size to at least 48 dp um, in horizontal and uh, vertical axis. So uh, this is kind of what the data does. Um, okay, uh, and then I have a bunch of view scanners, which is like an uh, abstract class. Uh, it's just like a like an iterator pattern to go through all of the types of view scanners to get all of the reports for every single view. So it's um, it's a generic thing, and it receives a view, uh, and then within or by knowing that view is let's say an image view, uh, you can generate a, li a view a list of view report items for that image view. It also has a function can scan, so it just takes in the view and uh, scans it if it can, so or gives you a boolean if it can scan it or not. So you can skip over, for example, if you have a text view, you don't want to scan it for image view issues because it's not an image view, so it doesn't make sense, right? So here is a, an example of the uh, like a generic view scanner or a general view scanner. Uh, it just checks for the big enough touch area. So for example, th this this is like a shorthand description. But basically, the, the issue type would be that the view is hard to touch. The actual um, issue would be that the view, view area is not large enough enough to click or touch because you have some kind of, kinds of listeners. 
And uh, the suggestion would be to make sure that your views are at least 48 dp large, so in both uh, axes. So you can, th this is all hard coded and all you know, handwritten. But the, the, one of the goals I want to uh, do for 1.0 is to add all very detailed descriptions and also add links uh, to documentation, say, uh, you know, which, which states why you should do this. So uh, there's one thing, you know, me saying, hey, you know, you should have at least 40 ADP large views. But another thing, you know, when it comes from Google and for, from the official documentation, right? Um, and of course, if it doesn't have any issues to detect or issues to report, it just returns an empty list. And in this example, the general view scanner can scan any view, right? So it doesn't have to be any types of view. Uh, generally, it just returns if the view is of some type. So a text view, an image view, and something similar. And here are some of the checks I have, like so, some of the ex uh, example checks I have. So this is for a different type of issue. This is for the uh, text contrast issue. So there are different kinds of things I find in the Android guidelines. So the there are two types of text defined for the Android guidelines. One is for norm, normal text and the other is for large text. Uh, large text is or like um, two contrast ratios, so normal and large. Uh, so basically if your view is 14 dp and bold <clears throat> or more than 18 uh, dp or sorry sp, then the contrast should be at least 3.0 because it's a large enough uh, text which you can read easily. If it's Anything other than that, so if it's smaller than 18 um, SP but not bold, or, you know, yeah, yeah that's basically it, right? Uh, then the view should have at least 4.5 contrast ratio. And the, the way I uh, calculate this contrast is through the current text color of the uh, view or the text view and the background color I have. So th there are some maths here. But basically, it takes the, the brighter color and uh, divides it through uh, with the darker col color and it see if the contrast is uh, big enough. And you have all these functions available within the actual um, Android system to, to get the, the, the actual contrast and everything from, uh, and luminance for every single text view. Um, and here is the algorithm where I actually scan the view. So, I didn't want it like it's very hard to show all of the code because it's very it's not that complex but it's recursions and it's kind of hard to go through. Uh, but this is a simple scan view function which takes all the children uh, from the current view group you want to scan. It takes its nested layers and its simple views. Uh, so nested layers will be view groups, which is why I have the check uh, for uh, view groups. Um, and the simple views are just, you know, any kinds of views that, any kind of views which are not view groups. Um, I get it, the, their ID and type, and I get, and I check if there are no, if there are uh, no nested layers or if there are any. I generate the basic report with the basic data, and then the child layer reports will be, if you have any nested layers, I'll call the function recursively and get, uh, for every single nested layer, its own report. Otherwise, I'll get null. So this is kind of, kind of how I generate the report. So for example, uh, if you have this structure, I hope it's not uh, too blurry or anything. If you have this structure, you would have one constraint layout, uh, two lay uh, nested layers within it, which are the frame layout and relative layout and a text view. And those other uh, nested layers can have more nested layers. Uh, you get a similar report to this. So you get one report, which gets the view reports, a list of the single text view. Um, and you will get two more reports, which one of the, is for the frame layout, let's say for the text view and the image view, and the other one is for the relative layout for the image view. And within the relative layout, you have another linear layout for image view, text view, and text view. So this is really complex to go through, you know, in terms of like writing the code. Uh, you, it's feasible, you can do it, but it's much easier if you just flatten the report and then print out something which is more linear like this. So one of my algorithm does this, algorithms does this, where it finds the layer reports for every single layer. So you, if you have, let's say, six nested um, layers within your UI, you would have six layers in total, right? And each layer will have one report, which contains all of the reports for every single view in that layer. So this is much easier uh, because you don't have to go through things uh, recursively. You can just go through a while loop or a for loop, and that's pretty much it. So uh, one thing that I, you have to notice here is, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor. Oh, you can. Um, so these two 
this layer, this is the layer zero or one, whatever you want to call it. This is layer one or two, and this is layer three. So uh, the, the middle layer has two different view groups. So there is no single parent to all of the reports, right? So what I do here is I just gener generate a report layer with an NA or like not available, which is uh, which I call a composite parent. So each of the text views will have uh, their own, uh, of course, um, uh, you know, layer and uh, view ID types and stuff like that. But the general report will be like a general composite layer. But does it actually work? So here is what you get when you run the library. So you get the like a textual report, which I print out, um, you know, by hand. And each uh, each layer has its own views. Each ha uh, each view has its IDs and parent IDs and some issues. So you can see all the issues here, and they are separated by you know general dashes and stuff like that. So this is kind of the general report. And this is really, really simple. But again, it gives you what you need. So you can see that at um, you know the general uh, container you have, you have a circle image view uh, within a swipe container. And this view doesn't have a content description or has an invalid description. So you can go there and fix that issue. Right. So the same goes for other issues. But basically, this is the gist of things. So it generates a report, which is detailed enough for you to go through the things and then realize what you have to fix. But there are some issues with accessibility in general. It's not all black and white. You can just say, this is an issue, and this is not. And you can fix this, and this is not. So there are some views which might not be important for accessibility. And sometimes you want to have just rule. Uh, the, the rules become guidelines instead of being strict rules. So this is a good example. This is a screenshot of the Discord server we have on Razor uh, or Raven Relic. And this is a list of messages. So if you take every message uh, closely and inspect it, uh, there's an image, there's a name of the speaker, or sorry, not the speaker, but the person who sent the message, uh, a timestamp, and the actual message. But if you look at it closely, this image doesn't bring any kind of information to the actual uh, you know, description of the content, right? If you are a person who su suffers from, um, you know, from full visual impairment, so you, you are blind, you don't really get any information from what the image is. You, how do you describe a person? It's very dynamic. It's, you know, everyone can describe themselves differently. So sometimes you don't want to have content descriptions in images, right? So what to do about those things? So is it okay to report those things or just ignore them? Well, the system can help us. And the system has two properties which you can set in XML, which will help, the, help me scan things. One is, uh, is view important in, for accessibility? And the other is, is important for autofill. And this generally gives you the ability to say, hey, this view is not important for accessibility, and this one is. But this also means that you can both help the system, or you can just ignore all the views that you don't want to scan. Or like, if you're using a library that scans for accessibility, you can just ignore views. So there are different modes here. You can say that something is not important, is important for full checks, um, not important, and all of it, its descendants are not important. So child layouts, uh, child, child, child views, sorry. And auto, which is the default one, where the system just takes some internal checks and gives you the, the answer. So it means that you can disable all of the checks for any view, which means that what's the purpose of my library then, right? So I'm kind of an, at a crossroads here where I would like to build something that's useful for developers, but I also don't want to, uh, you know, push things onto them so they kind of are annoyed by my library and then just decide to not use it. So my question to you is kind of should we just use the internal accessibility checks or I as a you know the, uh, developer of the library to ignore any kinds of accessibility issues? So if a person says this is not important for accessibility, I can say okay, I'm not going to check that. Or should we force accessibility checks and provide maybe just warning, maybe warnings instead of just issues, uh, or something like that? So I would definitely like to know what you think because I'm really keen on developing this library and helping out people, but I don't want to annoy people with you know checks that might not or should not be there. Um, so some of the next improvements uh, regarding the library are to you know test it across multiple different types of apps, app sizes, app API levels. Uh, types of building apps, so fragments, you know, custom views, all of that, uh, and make it backwards compatible with APIs older than 21. 
I chose 21 because it should be, you know, good enough now, but some applications might still use, you know, 16 or 19 or even lower than that, hopefully not. So I'll try to make it more backwards compatible. Um, I can also, I'm also trying to uh, add more quality of life improvements. So things like more handling for accessibility, better reports, more detailed reports with uh, links and documentation, and also opt-in opt analytics and stuff like that, where you can say, I don't want to check uh, image views, or I don't want to check text views, or I want to submit my reports to maybe like an analytics thing where I can analyze what the most common issues are and why they are happening to see if we can improve that somehow. So there's a lot of things to come. And if you want to participate or help me out or give me suggestions, you can find me on all of these links. So LinkedIn, Twitter, Raven, LinkedIn, Gmail, and a bunch of others. I'll show, show the presentation so you can see that. And I would like to thank you for listening to my talk. I hopefully didn't go uh, on for too long. I'm at about 30 something minutes. Um, so if we have a bit more time, I would uh, like to see if there are any questions regarding the library and answer them.